Bill Farmer again. Welcome back to McMaster University course Computer Science 1JC3 Introduction to Computational Thinking. We're going to continue talking about the topic of information security. So I'm going to have a question for you. Um, many operating systems are, have been based on Unix. Uh, today, the most popular operating systems based on Unix are Apple's OS X and Linux. Now, a Unix-based system has a count called the root account. This count has certain privileges. So the question is, does this count have the privilege to A, modify the root directory of the system, B, read the mail belonging to any account in the system, C, change the password of any account on the system, D, delete any file, any directory, and any user account. So your, the question then is which of these answers is correct? So I'll give you a moment to think about that. Okay, welcome back. Actually, the correct answer is A, B, C, and D. If you have, know the password to the root account on a Unix-based system, you can log into the root account, and then at that moment, you are all-powerful. You can do anything anyone could be authorized to do on that system including reading other people's mail, and very importantly, changing the password. So if somehow you learn the password of the root account, you could log in as root, change the password, now you control that machine. Uh, so this is, this is an interesting uh, security weakness of Unix-based systems. One account is all-powerful. Uh, the way Apple handles this on their machines is they try to do their very best to tell their, to say nothing about the root account to the users. So the vast majority of Apple based computer, Apple computers do not even know there is a root account. Uh, if you, if you uh, log in as root, you should all, in fact, you should very rarely ever log in as root. If you do log in as root and you do something stupid, it could permanently destroy, destroy your ability of your machine to work. For instance, if you uh, decided to delete your whole file system, if you were the root account and you made that command, it would delete your whole file system and your machine would be toast. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so we're interested in learning about information security. So one of the basic questions are, what are the threats and what are the possible ways of attacks? So what is a threat? A threat is any potential violation of confidentiality, integrity, or availability. An attack is an actual attempt to violate confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So an important part of information security is identifying what the threats are and preventing attacks. So there's many kinds of threats. I've listed a bunch here, system failure, system modification, resource theft, vandalism, system probing, unauthorized access, repudiation of origin. Repudiation of origin means, means that you deny that, uh, uh, someone can deny that they actually did something or sent something. Denial of receipt, delay, denial of service. And these threats come from many different places, faulty hardware, faulty software, configuration mistakes, operational mistakes. They, can, they come from insiders within an organization. They come from hackers who break into systems, criminals, vandals, and terrorists, malicious codes such as viruses, and natural disasters. And the different kinds of attacks are you can have unauthorized system access, 
which steal to steal information this violate, violates your confidentiality or to modify information this violates integrity you can have denial of service attacks this can violate availability and network probing where you seek out and try to understand how someone's network works network manipulation where you actually change how the network is structured for your advantage and resource theft okay so an important topic in information security is cryptography so what is cryptography well, i'm going to give two definitions the first is it is the art and science of concealing meaning so how do we protect meaning so that unauthorized people or software do not have access to the meaning of something. The second definition is it's a collection of mathematical techniques. So this is a more pragmatic definition. These techniques are for protecting data confidentiality, protecting data integrity, verifying the identity of objects, verifying the identity of subjects, subjects are people or software that use objects and producing random objects and there's different kinds of crypt cryptographic techniques the principal ones are conventional encryption cryptographic hashing one-way encryption public key encryption and random number generation so we're going to talk first about conventional encryption so the way this works is you can imagine we have uh, some document let's say which is called plain text and we want to make put that plain text into a form so it cannot be easily read it cannot easily be understood so this is plain text And we want to put it in a form that we cannot easily read. This is called ciphertext. So the way it works in conventional encryption is that we need a key. And this is a key that's secret. So we take this key and we take these two together. And then using an algorithm, which I'm going to call F, we modify this and we produce, we modify the plain text and produce ciphertext. And this modification is called encryption. You can think of it as modification, translation, something like that. And then we can go backwards where we have the key. And we have the cipher text, and that gives us back the plain text. So we go from plain text to, well, you, we actually use another algorithm, which I will call F inverse. So we go from plain text to cipher text, and then using the same key, we can go back to plain text. So the key is critical because often these algorithms are publicly known algorithms. Sometimes uh, not only are they publicly available but their code is available people know what the algorithms are so the key to secrecy is to protect the key and it's what we can say is mathematically infeasible to figure out what plain text goes with the cipher text without the key so we can't just look at the plain text in a mathematically easy way and from that compute the plain text we need the key so the key the, the key to protecting conventional encryption is to make the, sure the key is secret. So this is this kind of encryption goes way back. Uh, it goes back at least to the Romans. It's very old approach. There are many many encryption or conventional encryption algorithms have been developed over the past. Um, some are very hard to break. Some are easier to break. Okay, so I have another question for you. What is one-way encryption used for? Now, one-way encryption is like 
is like what we have up here, but uh, we don't have a key and we can't go backwards. So we can encrypt the plain text and ciphertext, but we don't have an algorithm to go backwards and it's mathematically infeasible to produce the plain text from the ciphertext. So what is this used for generally in computing? That's the question. So I'm going to give you a moment to think about that and I'll tell you the answer when we come back. Okay, welcome back. So the possible answers are electronically signing documents, exchanging keys for conventional encryption, protecting the integrity of software, and the last one is storing and computing, storing and checking passwords. This is it. So the way it works, is someone types in their password and then that password with one-way encryption is, produces a encrypted form and that's that's stored your password is not stored and this is stored in a safe place and if you type this in again the system will generate this and then it will compare the encrypted version of your password with the version that is stored in the computer and if they're the same then you have passed the authentic uh, authenticity check to make sure you're the person who you claim to be okay so that's one-way encryption okay so we're gonna stop here and next time we're going to talk about very interesting topic of public key encryption.